Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for giving the opportunity to talk on this uh, fine conference. And uh, I'm going to present together with my colleague Christian uh, uh, Marciniak our recent work on optimal metrology with variational quantum circuits, uh, which Christian Gross just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. So it's a, it, it will be a double talk. Uh, so we did a theory in Peter Zoller's group with our collaborator from Hannover. And very quickly, our experimental colleagues actually realized the ideas. So we will um, alternate between our talks if it's uh, not a problem technically. Uh, so I will start with uh, presenting the variational approach to quantum uh, optimal metrology. Um, and then Christian will uh, show you the realization, actual realization on the trap times they did. And then I'll conclude with the implications uh, it has for clocks and the relevant quantum advantage we can achieve on the other platforms. And by the way, uh, by the way, the uh, works uh, described here are on archive at the moment. Um, so um, as Christian uh, Gross presented us, the quantum simulators, we are going to look exactly at this kind of systems and we want to use them now as a programmable quantum sensors. So first, let me tell you what I understand by quantum simulator and now a quantum simulator. And here I talk in, in, uh, explicitly about ions because the implementations uh, is an ion uh, system, uh, but in, in general, it works uh, for Rydbergs as well. So what uh, an quantum simulator is a quantum system with a limited programmability, unlike a quantum computer. Uh, however, it is scalable, unlike a quantum computer. Um, so what we can do there, we can start from a certain uh, state of our uh, spins and apply available gates, which have a limited set, some interaction, rotations, interactions. In this way, we can prepare a, a wave function. And after that, uh, we can apply a, high, a hybrid classical quantum algorithm where we take the measurement outcomes processing on a classical computer and apply quantum feedback. So we change the, uh, uh, the, change, uh, the circuits. Um, and the point is that if we introduce a cost function, um, which can be uh, optimized efficiently on a quantum uh, on a classical computer so uh, we can it can be minimized but uh, in order to evaluate it you need a quantum computer because it depends on the on this uh, large uh, entangled quantum states and then by defining a proper cost function you can uh, encode different kind of problems into this uh, device and this way you can uh, solve the variational you can have variational quantum angle sol eigensolver or variational or quantum approximate uh, optimization algorithms so uh, here we will talk about application of these variational ideas to quantum metrology and uh, well why quantum metrology in this case is uh, interesting is first of all because the very same system the trapped ions or Rydbergs uh, they can be seen as quantum sensors, and, and in some sense they are already. Mm. So uh, let me remind you what a quantum sensor, and in particular Ramsey interferometry, is. Here we have a very similar uh, uh, case uh, as in a quantum simulator. We start with a certain state of our ions, then apply a gate, which is just a global rotation around y-axis, and this way, we prepare a coherent spin state pointing towards us on this box here. So the blue uh, point here is a, a bigger function of the coherent spin state. And after that, uh, we have a free evolution, uh, according to the Hamiltonian JZ, which encodes this phase phi into the state uh, of, of the uh, atoms, um, such that this evolution is just a rotation of the states. Therefore, the phi is the angle of rotation. And after that, we just need to rotate it back to the JZ basis and perform measurement of the collective spin. And this way we can uh, uh, estimate what was the angle of rotation, therefore estimating the phase. So that's how atomic clocks are, works and well, magnetometry as well. Uh, 
Um, so what are the ways to improve uh, these kind of sensors? They're known for quite some time now. Since 90s, we know that one can uh, introduce a spin squeezing, which will uh, reduce the shot noise along this uh, measurement axis and that does improve the well, sensitivity. And how it's done, you just in, you have to introduce a nonlinear gate uh, additionally here, which is uh, called squeezing, or in this case, it's a one axis twisting uh, operation, which does exactly this with the coherent uh, spin state. And then there are JZ state and uh, so on. So what we want to do here, if we have such systems as, as a quantum uh, programmable quantum simulators and we now interpret them as a programmable quantum sensors we can actually do the following we can go to the uh, limit and uh, introduce the generalized ramsey interferometer where uh, the uh, initial state of spins uh, are spins evolved according to some general uh, unitary which performs entangling operation and preparing the optimal input state followed by free evolution, the same free evolution encoding the phase phi. And after that, we introduce a decoder, which uh, further transforms the state, uh, or one can look at it as it actually transforms the measurement such that the measurement becomes a, a non-local entangled measurement. And this way we can go to the uh, optimal quantum metrology. But the question is, uh, as uh, so now, now the question is, what's the cost function for this variational approach? Because the cost function, as I uh, mentioned, uh, is defines the uh, variational algorithm. And of course, how to actually implement this uh, variational ansatz with uh, low depth circuits, which can be realized in real device. Um, and on top of this, we have to take into account the uh, limited native resources available on a quantum uh, machine like if you have a, if you have a uh, quantum computer and quantum computer then uh, there are global rotations and one axis uh, global one axis twisting gate in case of uh, um, quantum simulators the resources can be different and instead of global uh, global twisting operation you will have something like easing uh, model uh, nearby uh, short range easing model and therefore it will lead to actually solving a money body problem on a quantum device and that can be interpreted as a quantum advantage um, so but uh, in order to introduce you the optimal well the cost function leading to the optimal uh, interferometry uh, we start with the application actually we look at the application one of the applications of these quantum sensors and namely uh, atomic clocks and we will use here the bayesian approach i will mention the fisher information and cramerol uh, bound and i'll tell you why we choose bayesian one as a relevant in this case so uh, let me remind you the what atomic clocks are from theoretical point of view uh, it's a laser with a very stable uh, frequency which is still fluctuating in time due to classical noise then if you look at the fluctuation of the phase uh, with respect to some uh, reference uh, frequency we'll see that this phase uh, drifts in time and uh, after some, some time capital t uh, we get a almost gaussian distribution with certain width and this width is given by the uh, laser noise properties. So it depends on whether your laser is pink uh, uh, noise or short noise uh, limited. Um, and now in order to do clocks, uh, we do introduce an atomic ensemble, which gives you this reference uh, omega naught. And, uh, and this allows you to measure this phase uh, difference and correct uh, the laser frequency so and and we do it stroboscopically uh, with Ramsey interrogation time t many times uh, in a row and this way we can stabilize the laser frequency and now the uh, so the problem for the uh, optimal Ramsey interferometry is uh, to properly 
or estimate the stochastic phase phi as phi as good as possible with a single ensemble and a single shot because there is uh, there will be no second shot uh, to repeat the measurement uh, for averaging now, on the next run the phase will be different so that, that's the problem we want to solve with the uh, optimal quantum interferometer so and how we can uh, formulate this uh, problem is the following so we have our original uh, quantum circuit which is prepared in some uh, initial uh, state we apply some general uh, entangling operation then uh, free evolution encoding the phase decoder and perform measurements the measurements will be a measurement will be a projection of uh, jz component and it, it has uh, some statistics for given input state and coder decoder you'll get the statistics depending on on the phase phi uh, now the uh, problem is to given the measurement outcome m to estimate if phi as uh, good as possible and uh, there are uh, as i mentioned already if you now forget about decoder like it's known uh, since a uh, long time that introducing entangling operation we can go to squeezing of the coherent spin state or even to jhz state uh, which will give you better and better sensitivity in fact in terms of fissure information which measures how sensitive your uh, the in, in input state to the perturbation by the free evolution uh, so jhz gives you the uh, maximum sensitivity in that case so it looks like here you can see that it has the steepest slope um, however the, this approach there is a problem that together with the increased sensitivity uh, the range of uh, unambiguous uh, uh, definition of, of phi uh, is also shrinking as 1 over n therefore if we look uh, actually uh, uh, in terms uh, at this uh, problem in terms of uh, mean square error of our interferometer which depends on the uh, injected phi's phi we'll have the following picture so we see that for different phi's uh, uh, coherent spin state and uh, squeeze, squeeze spin state uh, yeah the squeeze spin state is works better for phases around zero and jz state works exceptionally good for the phases around zero but it doesn't work everywhere anywhere else and the problem is that as i said for example for clocks we actually have a some prior distribution for the phase phi and it has some finite width therefore the interferometer we would like to have should actually have this kind of uh, mean square error profile with a finite dynamic range so this width i call dynamic range and in order to find such a uh, interferometer we introduce a cost function which is given by the bayesian mean square error so we just average this mean square error with the uh, prior distribution and this way we get a bayesian update uh, from the prior to the posterior width and we just want to minimize this posterior width and this optimization we now can vary the variational parameters of our encoder and decoder and try to see what uh, the device they will produce and also the encoder and decoder they build off here we introduce this uh, variational ansatz where each decoder consists of layers of global rotations twisting 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 operation is a standard operation in ions uh, and rotation is just a rotation and now i would like to uh, switch uh, to uh, christian uh, presentation uh, such that he can uh, give us the uh, present the result of uh, our talk our work do you expect now questions discussion or you no 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 le 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 let's do it afterwards very good so uh, do we have a christian online yes christian is online welcome do you, do you see my slides yes and floor is yours Excellent. Um, well, all right, this is how it is now. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm a postdoc in Rainer Blatt's group at the University of Innsbruck. 
Uh, I'll be talking about our experimental implementation of the theory work that Denise has just uh, told you about. Um, what we are proposing is programmable quantum sensors utilizing programmable you know, quantum devices as sensors that approach the optimum in quantum sensing. So that's a pretty uh, broad claim where we should better provide some data to back it up. And this is exactly um, what we've done. Uh, so this is a collaborative effort. Uh, the experimental team here in Rainer Blatt's group, um, Thomas Mons, the supervisor, and then the team, Thomas Felkavania and I. Um, we have implemented what Denise has been telling you about on the Action Experimental Platform. This is a, a very new experiment we've uh, published on VRX Quantum, if you're interested in it. It's a rack-based quantum computer that fits into two server racks, very much uh, similar to what you can see in data centers. Uh, it's a very compact device and it's uh, fairly powerful. On the details, I will not um, go into much detail about how it works exactly, but suffice it to say, uh, we're currently I have demonstrated the largest fully entangled state without post selection or error mitigation to date. You can see some um, you know, schematics of what it looks like because it's very hard to take pictures of something so compact uh, and what the racks look like, you can see up on the top. And in it, uh, we typically crystallize linear chains of calcium 40 ions in a linear pole trap, it's a microscopic trap. We can take images of ion chains, as you can see here, with just a commercial EMC CD camera. And the resource operations, however imperfect they may be, are implemented via a single global laser beam that traverses the spine of the trap and the ion chain, as you can see here. Now, these resource operations, um, Denise has already told you for us, are collective qubit rotations. So these are single qubit rotations, but all ions do them at the same time. And likewise, we have one axis twisting, squeezing, or for us implemented the uh, malmö sorensen interaction. And this malmö sorensen interaction and these, these qubit rotations, we have to implement somehow natively on our trapped ion device. Uh, and since it's um, you know an atomic system or an ionic system, these interactions live on level schemes like you can see here in the, on the right. We have for the rotation operator, uh, simple Rabi flops that is resonantly driving a qubit interaction at 729 nanometers. So the length and power of a laser pulse determines this angle beta that goes into the rotation operators and an optical phase determines which axis we uh, rotate around. So we have the choice between X and Y and Z we implement differently. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward, but for the uh, nonlinear interactions, the twisting, it's actually the malma sorensen interaction, which is you know, possibly the most well-known and most often used nonlinear interaction in trapped ions. It's by no means the only gate that does that. It's a uh, you know, an interaction that um, excites collective spin flips. It's uh, pretty robust but, uh, with respect to the phonon occupation of the bus that mediates spin spin interactions between ions, as long as it doesn't change during the operation. Um, this, what you can see here on the right, is you know, the simplest level scheme that you can think of. You have only two particles that are in the motional ground state. Uh, and there is different paths that connect this electronic double ground state to the excited state. And if you tune your gate parameters correctly, there's destructive interference between these different paths such that the intermediate states are never occupied. Uh, this, of course, generalizes to larger systems like we do. These schemes get you know, very unwieldy to draw, but the general concept is very much the same. There's one parameter I'd like to point out here. Um, because it features later, and that's this detuning epsilon of the bichromatic beam that mediates the Masserens interaction. This is the detuning from the motional mode that you address to mediate your interaction. And these angles that we have to specify in the variational approach, these, these thetas here that go into the uh, entangling and decoding unitary, 
we have to be able to vary. Now for the uh, rotations, that's downright trivial. We just change how long a laser pulse is. But for the twistings, it's not as simple because uh, we don't have a direct immediate measure of what this angle is. This angle is a geometric phase in the malma sorensen gate. That is the area that the ions and close in phase space during the gate operation. Um, so the question is, how do we tune up? How do we calibrate these gates? Especially if we want to do online on-device optimization where we don't even know what the device wants as an angle beforehand. And what we do is um, pretty straightforward, I guess. The first thing we do is we make GHZ states. This is something we know very well how to do because there is an a, a entanglement witness that tells us the fidelity of our GHZ operation that's simply uh, very easy to read out. Uh, and as I said, we're very good at doing this. With, currently with 24 um, ions, the largest GHZ state to date. And what we do is... Uh, exploit several relationships of the parameters that make up a gate. The first thing that we note is that the time of a gate and the detuning for the phase-based trajectories to be close, so we don't have any spin motion entanglement at the end of the gate, is given by this relationship here, where k is some integer that determines how many times we make loops in phase space. And the second relation is if the first one holds, this angle chi, the geometric phase, our twisting angle, is related to the detuning uh, like so. So what we do is this. We start making a gate that makes a GHZ state using eight loops. We know that the entangling phase is pi on two. Uh, so now we reduce the time to one eighth of that while keeping the detuning constant. Now we know that it's pi on two divided by eight, so pi over 16. And now, this is about the angle range that we need for the scheme. We can change the time and the detuning in tandem together uh, a little bit in every direction to change the exact angle that we want. We can't, don't have a uh, you know, direct measure of what the angle is exactly, but if we do our calibration to begin with very well, and with many loops, our phase is actually quite sensitive, then this can be done efficiently uh, and very well, as we can see in the data later. Now, uh, there is a caveat that I need to raise, and that is that the Mommasurance interaction is natively in the X or Y basis. Again, optical phases determine where it is in that plane, but it's never in the Z basis. But if you look at the unitaries that uh, Denise has shown you, and they're also up here on the slide, then there's some twisting along Z. But what we can do is just rotate the entire sequence by 90 degrees. Now, all of our interactions are in the XY plane where we'd like them with the slight caveat that the phase and the evolution is now picked up around Y, which is a thing we need to uh, remember for later. All right, but these are all the ingredients that we need. Uh, what's left is to look at what happens if we actually implement this. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to do is just, you know, we have the theory collaborators, they have thought of uh, what these optimal parameters should be given the input uh, of, you know, how many particles do we have and what are the the prior width, uh, and then we do have finite fidelity, but trapped ions have among the highest fidelities uh, in all platforms. So the first thing to do is try out the angles that the theorists said uh, should be good. And that's exactly what we did. Um, we look at several measures here, the very simple ones. On top, you can see the expected value of the spin Z. That's what we see directly in an ion trap as di uh, bright or dark. And on the bottom, you can see the mean square error that um, Denise has mentioned. Uh, this is a plot for 16 particles. And so this blue is the coherent spin state. That's our baseline, what we want to compare our optimization to. And then we can do input state optimization that looks you know, very similar to squeezing. And what we can see is that this uh, mean square error is reduced around zero. Now you'll notice that the shape in my plot doesn't match the shape that uh, Denise has shown. And that is simply the choice of the phase estimator slope that we've used. Um, what you can also see is that the spin state performs just as well or bad as the coherent spin state if you move around for larger phase values. Now, what we can also do in the scheme is optimize the measurement operator. Uh, 
And you can see that the expected value doesn't look sinusoidal anymore. Uh, it's starting to look very much like a line in the center and then you know, approaching sawtoothy behavior. And this is uh, reflected in the mean square error in the, in the fact that the measurement operator optimization leads to a wider dynamic range. So a wider range where a linear estimator is good. And then if we combine the two, we get the combination of the effects. The mean square is low and also very wide, which is exactly what we want for our cost function, which as an integral over many phase values uh, needs to stay low. Now we can look at this in you know, more quantitative, more comprehensive measures, such as, for example, um, these plots here. We, we see a ratio of our posterior knowledge, that is the, the knowledge that I've gained over the value of phi after a measurement is concluded, and this divided by our prior knowledge. So this encodes how much I haven't learned about the value of phi. So if this ratio were zero, I'd have learned everything there is. Quantum mechanics has some limitations of how much I can learn. If this value or this ratio is one, I've learned nothing at all. And now what you uh, can see here in this log log plot, the data here being for 12, uh, is a couple of things. The first is that there's an optimal prior width and that optimum that depends on what the sequences that you use, how much input state and how much measurement operator optimization you do. Uh, and so this, this minimum goes towards smaller values of phi if you do input state optimization. So for clocks, that would be shorter Ramsey times. And if you do measurement operator optimization, it goes to larger values, which is generally good. And the next thing that you can see is that the sequence complexity as it grows, the deviation of the data from the theory lines grows as well. Now, that's not at all surprising because doing more gates, performing more operations, each of which, which has uh, finite fidelity, these errors should accumulate. And we've seen that this is consistent across different ion numbers, as you can see in that inset there. But the important point is that the optimized sequences, that is the red dots, outperform the simple spin squeezing strategies that people have previously done at both the optima of uh, both of these curves. And what is also very important to note is that not only do we beat the other sequences, but we stay very close to the boundary to the forbidden region in shaded red. So that is we perform uh, optimization, we perform measurements close to what is optimal, what is optimally allowed in quantum mechanics. And then on the bottom, you have a measure that is familiar to a lot of metrologists. That's the Allen variance uh, plotted in a bit funny unit, so I can uh, make no mention of our reference frequency. This is the very same data, just replotted in this different measure, along with some limitations to the Allen variance. So these two plots have very much the same information. And if you're a you know quantitatively minded person, here's this data table for a couple of different particle numbers that we've measured and a reference to typical numbers in optical lattice clocks. And in particular, I'd like to highlight this gap to the optimal quantum clock that is, uh, you know, how much you can possibly do. And this gap is relative to that one, two sequence that we've picked. So uh, it will, even the theory will grow as the particle numbers increase. Um, but these, these distances to the absolute optimum are very pleasingly small, given that this is the very first implementation of this scheme. Uh, so what uh, we've also done is, you know, in lieu of us being able to perform an actual clock experiment for which we're currently not set up in our electronics is a frequency estimation or noise reconstruction experiment. So we inject a known amount of noise into a, the sequences that we perform, and then using one, the base reference classical Ramsey, and then two, our optimized sequences, we try to reconstruct what this noise was. So on the, uh, or on the vertical, you can see the difference between what we've known to be true to be injected and what we've estimated. And again, you can see that the optimized sequences outperform the classical Ramsey interferometer. That is what we've hoped, but strikingly, it outperforms it at every Ramsey time that we've considered. Now, I say this is striking because the parameters that make up the sequence are optimal for one Ramsey time and one Ramsey time only. That's around the 
for a millisecond mark here. The fact that we outperform the classical Ramsey everywhere else tells us something about the robustness of the scheme with uh, relative to system parameters that can be fluctuating. So for us, that would be the Ramsey time, but in optical lattice clocks, for example, or uh, generally called atom experiments, this could be also the particle number. Now this experiment is far from perfect. You can see these several lines for uh, theory where we have in dash the very simple theory where we assume ideal operation and then uh, more complicated numerical simulations in solid lines with error tubes where we include uh, flicker noise on our laser and the fact that we have only um, finite fidelity approximations of the ideal mean square error. Um, but the important thing to take away is that the optimized sequences, even, be, even despite all of these imperfections and including the additional overhead that the longer sequences uh, incur, we still outperform the classical Ramsey. And then to switch gears, and the last bit that I wanted to talk about is uh, on-device self-calibration of the scheme, which is something that is of great importance to systems not like trapped ions. So the idea is again, uh, to perform variational optimization, but instead of using the theory angles that we've got from a computer cluster, we would like to do this on the device. So the device finds these values itself. And why would we do this? Well, one reason is that the parameters that we get are for the noiseless case. So if we had perfect fidelity gates, but we don't. So what we actually implement and what we wanted to implement need not be the same. And this is the case, well, it doesn't matter what your fidelity is, if it's not one, everyone will end up in this case as you increase the number of particles in your system because that typically degrades scale fidelity. And then the other uh, side is that maybe you have a system where calculating these parameters on a cluster isn't even possible because it's numerically intractable. So what we did is, uh, feign ignorance of what these parameters are, and then also go to the regime where our fidelities have degraded sufficiently that we can't actually perform this calibration accurately anymore. So what you can see here is a, uh, you know, an optimizer run for 26 ions. That is the number of ions where all my calibration curves started to look the same. So I have no clue what my twisting angles are anymore. It's an optimization run using a um, classical optimizer that's developed in-house by Rick von Beinen. Uh, we use here seven parameters of the nine because two of them turned out to be approximately zero anyway. And what you can see is as the measurement index, that is the number of runs progresses, our estimate of what the optimal parameters are as measured by our cost function, they drop very quickly below what the best classical uh, system could do. And then they drop below what inputs state optimization, so squeezing would do. And then they hover around the theory of what the best is you can do in our scheme. And I highlight this, that this uh, progression is despite the fact that I cannot optimize my parameters, I cannot uh, calibrate those. So the machine actually finds by measurement on its own what these parameters are in the presence of noise and drift and whatever plagues an experimentalist. And I will highlight these red crosses that you can see here. These are when the optimizer decides that this is a promising point, uh, and then it performs a finer scan to have a look. And you can see here two different um, mean square errors uh, on the top again for the one, two sequence with the fully optimized and the bottom just the spin squeezing. And as you can see, the data again approaches the solid lines, the theory of the noiseless case. These are theory lines with no free parameters. This is not a fit. This is just what the theory tells us is the best you can do. So with this, we can demonstrate that uh, this on-device optimization, this auto calibration can find optimal parameters with no input knowledge of what are the uh, fidelities, what are the noise fields, what are the correlations between these. And we can approach the noise-free case. And uh, this is about what I wanted to talk about. And I'll hand back to Denise. Thank you very much. OK. So, so can ask questions to both speakers. Or, 
Well, maybe let me first finish the full talk. And yeah, I ha still have some things to say about. Uh, do you see my screen now? Okay, so uh, this optimization uh, procedure, um, as shown, um, sort of lacks the uh, transparency. So we, when you just do the optimization on the device, you actually don't really know what's going on. So the question is, how does this interferometer, the optimal interferometer actually works? What are the optimal states which are generated and what are the optimal measurements? So that's what I want to show you briefly uh, here. So here, uh, kind of to uh, eliminate this uh, array a bit, I show you the Wigner functions of the uh, measurement operator. Uh, in this case, I, first I look at this, this simple uh, squeezing scheme where we have only entangling operation and no decoding operations. Uh, and that means that the measurement is just a JY measurement. And uh, so on this block sphere, I show the measurement operator in this uh, red, blue uh, shades, where different color bands uh, roughly corresponds to different uh, measurement outcomes. And the Wigner uh, state of the uh, Wigner function of the quantum state is this uh, gray uh, shaded area uh, for the squeeze state. We have this nice ellipse. And what we uh, have here, so what, what should we look at, is the overlap of the uh, quantum state with these different color bands of the measurement operator. It uh, tells you how many how wide would be the distribution of your measurement outcomes. So if the state covers many bands, then your uh, distribution will be wide. And that's the same picture from looking from the top. And I plotted for different phases in coding. So zero phase, pi over three, and two pi over three. And you see that uh, sort of the optimizer here chose the squeezing, chose not to squeeze too much such that if it would be squeezed stronger, then you would have a strong overlap with different uh, uh, color bands here, and that would widen your measurement distribution. So here I plot the measurement outcomes, uh, M, uh, for different phases, uh, phases, phase zero, phase pi over three, and two pi over three. And here we can clearly see that uh, this uh, interferometer cannot distinguish these two angles, phi one and phi two, because they you sort of you over rotate and uh, go to the other side of the block sphere, such that statistically, from the measurement point of view, it's indistinguishable, uh, these two uh, phases. That's why you kind of, you have effectively, your dynamic range here is reduced to be from minus pi over two to pi over two at most. Now, if you looked at the uh, similar uh, Wigner functions uh, for the optimal quantum interferometer, we see a very different picture especially the uh, measurement itself you see now these color bands they are aligned with the meridians so if you look from the top this actually uh, these color bands they look like sort of a clock and uh, this allows uh, the optimizer to squeeze the initial state much stronger uh, such that the and the, the state now overlaps favorably with like single measurement outcomes and the we see it in the uh, probability distribution for the measurement outcomes which are much narrow now and most importantly now this phase uh, pi over three and two pi over three is clearly distinguishable so this measurement operator can sort of look uh, behind the block sphere and th that's how it extends the dynamic range almost from minus pi to pi but that's the optimum interferometer and now if you take it a variational interferometer with one three sequence a bit deeper than the done ex in experiment but this is also for larger system size i think the, here i plotted for 64 atoms so we see that the variational interferometer with a uh, well finite depth uh, circuit finds a uh, state in the measurement which is very close to the optimal interferometer although the state is a kind of has this funny uh, twisted shape so it is not a conventionally squeezed state. So that, that, that's actually the state which is very close to what uh, Christian produced in his device. Uh, as we saw that the data matches 
closely the, to the theory. Uh, it means that the state is also actually has this kind of shape. Um, but you see, so although the state is twisted, the measurement is also twisted in the same way such that it doesn't uh, uh, kind of reduce the performance of the interferometer and the distribution of the measurement outcomes looks very similar to the optimum performance. So that's basically how the uh, interferometer works. And now I can uh, maybe quickly come back to the optical, uh, to the atomic clocks uh, as the experiment well, were, were not designed to perform a clock uh, demonstration. So we have uh, our theoretical prediction what would be the performance of the uh, uh, real atomic clock imp implementing this optimal interferometry. And here I show you the Allen deviation. Well, not exactly the Allen deviation, this quantity, but the dimensions pre-factor in front of it. Um, so, and, and here I have the Ramsey time scaled by the laser uh, bandwidth, laser noise bandwidth. So here the dashed curve shows this uh, optimal interferometer curve, like uh, found in this uh, paper. And we have a coherent spin state here, and the dashed line shows you the standard quantum limit, 1 over square root of n scaling. Uh, another uh, interesting limit here is the so-called Heisenberg limit, scaling 1 over n, which is saturated by the JZ state. So you can see that the JZ state-based quantum clock works better than the classical clock, but it's still very far away from the optimal uh, interferometer. So now if we... Uh, another interesting uh, curve or limit here is the spike-corrected Heisenberg limit, which is where... which which is really limiting the optimal quantum interferometer and uh, the full optimal quantum clock. This is, was very recently shown to be a uh, universal uh, bound. And now if I plot here the result of clocks uh, built on, uh, built using the optimal, uh, the variational quantum interferometer, so we see that the uh, sequence, uh, so the orange one is a squeeze state clock, outperforms the JZ state and one three uh, circuit already comes very close to the optimum. However, this is very kind of uh, simple prediction. Um, we just transformed our uh, posterior distribution um, to uh, draw this picture, but the question is how the actual clock will work. And to uh, check that it really will uh, perform as well, we have implemented, uh, with the help of our colleague from Hanover, uh, the uh, paper clock. So that's a classical simulation or computer simulation of the stochastic process of clock stabilization. There they simulate up to 10 to the 5 uh, clock cycles and extract this uh, dimension sigma from uh, the calculation. And then the data plot, that's a numerical simulation follows very closely the prediction. So this way we are very kind of sure that that should really work <clears throat> as a clock. Um, well, then I can briefly mention you that the, if you now uh, look at the scaling with number of atoms, then the optimal quantum clock will almost reach the 1 over n scaling uh, plastic logarithmic corrections which are already known since uh, quite, quite some time. These are more tight bound. And we also see that uh, the one three circuit is very close to the optimal clock up to 1000 atoms. Yeah, and one final uh, uh, thought that uh, concerning the on-device optimization and why it's so important is particularly because of the other platforms like Friedberg atoms, where you have a uh, 2D, uh, 2D geometry and a lot of atoms interacting uh, via finite range, which makes the problem of uh, optimizing on a classical computer in, impossible to solve. So for n more than 50 spins, it's just uh, intractable. Therefore, uh, on the actual platforms available now with hundreds of atoms in uh, Rydberg arrays, one would need to perform this on-device optimization to uh, prepare the optimal quantum interferometer. And that, in a sense, would lead to a relevant quantum advantage because there is no other way of uh, solving and optimizing this uh, device. 
And with this, I would like to conclude. And uh, so we uh, presented you the optimal quantum uh, interferometry via variational quantum circuits, both theory and experiment. Um, and so we demonstrated the on-device optimization, which uh, promises us to reach classically inaccessible regime on, on Rydberg platforms. And with this, I would like to thank uh, you for the attention and uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So, uh, now we can ask questions to both speakers, De uh, Dennis and Christian. And the first question, please. Uh, give me microphone. Yeah, Denise and uh, Christian, uh, very, very great uh, results. Uh, I have probably a trivial question. Um, when you showed basically the performance of the standard coherent spin state, the optimum est est uh, estimation was, or the best estimation was not where the slope was maximum. Uh, why is, is there this double hump uh, uh, feature? Ah, so that, that, that's this uh, on the, in the experimental uh, yeah, yeah, Christian report. Yeah, yeah. Well, th this double hump happens because um, because of two uh, uh, competing sort of noise uh, sources. One uh, at at zero phase, uh, the only uh, kind of imperfection for the estimation comes from the shot noise. But when you rotate uh, stronger, so let's say if your rotation angle is pi over two, then shot noise is disappears. So you will have exactly uh, n over two. Uh, so you, you will measure an eigenstate. So uh, shot noise disappears when uh, when the angle of rotation increases, but uh, the bias increases as well uh, when the phi uh, go, becomes larger. So the, there are two competing processes there, and they they create this uh, hump. Okay, well, we should talk at one point. I thought always it's flat, basically, if you, because of short noise decreases in the same way as the slope. I think this is your bias also decreases, but oh, we can, we can just the coffee it. break. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe a simpler answer would be that um, the slope of this uh, phase estimator is a free parameter in the optimization. We numerically find which slope optimizes the cost function, and that happens to be that one. Yes, a, a naive question. In in this uh, device and optimization experiment, the, the same system makes the optimization, and that's the one where you you want to minimize uh, the uh, the noise and uh, improve the accuracy. But can we imagine now that uh, you use uh, the ions or what the system to to compute a correction or the optimal uh, phases on a uh, to to give the information on a clock like a strontium clock or another clock that is not the same device so it, is that possible to to imagine uh, implement this optimization on something which is not the system itself hmm. christian what would you say i, I would say uh, you know given a universal fault tolerant quantum computer the answer is yes otherwise it might be harder for the you know faulty quantum computer to find the solution than the actual device. Yeah, so better to yeah. use the device itself to make the optimization. Yeah, I would say well, it depends on the device. So if your device is hard to simulate, unlike the what Christian had, where there are uh, global interactions, uh, yeah, then the best answer would be to use actually the the device itself. On the other hand, yeah, in principle you can if. There is another more. I just don't see why would another platform be more convenient than, than the one which you have. So uh, the second speaker mentioned readout noise. I understand there'll be just classical readout noise and mentioned error mitigation. But then I understand in metrology, error mitigation would not work. So uh, my question is, do you use error mitigation it was just mentioned in the second talk uh, just how to verify your device 
and so might be yeah you're right error mitigation and metrology is possibly a terrible idea if you correct phases and you want to measure phases we do not do error mitigation ever my comment was however based on uh the ghz states you know to to contrast it with uh other results where larger GHZ states were produced, but error mitigations boosted the fidelity by 200%. But then in your setup, you still have readout errors and you just optimize the parameters to fight them uh, per se. We do have readout errors in trapped ions. They're exceedingly small, but they are present. And one of the nice features of the scheme is that for the on device optimization, the parameters are found in the presence of all these. Right, so these are the optimal parameters given the infidelities, including readout noise that we do have. Okay, let us allow for the further questions, please. Yes, I'm, I'm curious about the um, uh, interaction before the measurement because there are optimal schemes which do not require that. Uh, so you can do separable measurements and still achieve the optimal uh, sensitivity. But yes. But there's a noiseless case, so maybe here you need... Mm. Okay, I, I, I think I can comment on it. So as far as I know, the origin of, uh, of what you're saying is from, I think it's a PRL, uh, Seth Lloyd is there and then some other people, where they prove the theorem uh, showing that the for optimal quantum uh, Metrology uh, measured by uh, fissure information. Uh, you don't need a decoder right. because because the optimal uh, state then JHZ and we can measure optimally. We can measure JHZ with separable measurements. The thing is that the key thing here is this fissure information, which is which measures sensitivity for infinitesimal range around given phase. And as you can see, that's why I showed this plot. So if you implement the actual clock with JZ state, that's what you get, which is much. Yeah, but but there, are, there are tricks. Maybe also in that paper, there was some stupid trick that uh, you can uh, just simply increase slightly the overhead, like doubling the number of systems and you still ah well yeah yeah increase if you the, if you the you, dynamic you, range you you can uh, that's why with jz states what you have to do is to actually implement adaptive measurements not necessarily you can do uh, it without, without adaptive measurements yeah there was a paper I'm by if... howard wiseman that pointed that out yes Next okay, uh, and now I'm not sure what, uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss uh, later. But the, the, the thing is that... For the questions. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I didn't, uh, I didn't so, want to monopolize uh, this So this is probably theory questions to Denis. So it's Rafał demkowicz Uh So mm -hmm. I would like to, to ask you, because your optimization is basically like a single interrogation time optimization process, yes? You focus yes. on like a single step in the whole process of running of atomic clock. Yes. So I was wondering if you have some some ideas to do it further because you cite our paper on this yes, quantum yes, variance yes. stuff. Yes. So I wonder if you can assess how relevant is the fact that from interrogation step to interrogation step, you in fact have some correlations in noise. And yeah. that's why maybe it's not enough to focus on just single step, but you have to think about the whole process when you optimize. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, based on your paper, we know that the optimum uh, quantum clock with uh, this uh, uh, with entangled measurements between clock cycles uh, is certainly better. And uh, so we ha we ha we can try and do it. It's just well, it will be another level of complexity. Uh, so I'm not sure how implementable it, it is, but yeah, that's certainly a next step to try and see what can be done about this uh, entangled clock cycles. Um, because yeah, he, here we clearly see that we do not uh, fully reach this one over n scaling because there is this nasty uh, logarithmic correction. Actually, I'm not sure what's, what's actually theoretical scaling of uh, in your paper. I don't remember. Is it true one over n or also something? is missing there but yeah th that's an interesting uh, open question to try and see how implementable it is 
Go. Next question, please. Yeah, so my question is, let's say a follow-up to Lorenzo's question. So if you consider Bayesian cost, then in, at least in some instances you may find analytically the optimal measurement. It's, collect it's collective measurement usually. And here you showed, at least in experiment, that you are making uh, measurement optimization. So my question is, do you know how close you are to this optimal measurement that you can derive? Um, measurement, so, well, how close? I mean, you, you mean on this figure, it looks very close. Yeah, but I mean, if, if this optimal measurement that you can consider here is like the optimal measurement for Bayesian cost, or is it something else? I don't get I mean, there, the... are, there were those papers by like Howard, Howard Weissman from 90s where they consider, for example, flat Bayesian, flat prior knowledge, and they, they can find the optimal measurement there. Ah, I see. Well, um, so you, you talk about this phase operator, I guess. Yeah, I mean, because this is basically what you are doing. Yeah, you are uh, well, the, I would say the phase operator is suboptimal in this case because the prior is Gaussian. and. Um, and, and the, it's it's very crucial that uh, well for real application like clocks this Gaussian has an infinite support so it it never fits nicely into this minus pi pi interval um, and it has some consequences like for example this logarithmic correction uh, to the scaling with n uh, so if you look into our paper uh, I specifically did the comparison with this phase operator and uh, yeah you see that if n increases to more than 100, then we start to actually converge to this uh, phase operator. So in the limit n goes to infinity, these are the same measurements. But of course, it's, it's hard to do it variationally with fixed uh, uh, circuit depth. So we have to increase the circuit depth to, to approach it. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? I don't see them, so let us thank again both speakers. Thank you.